You guys don't even know what we're going to talk about, really, do we? We do not. <laughs> what I thought we could start with is something I am a Marianosis. So some of you, I don't, you guys probably don't know me, so you don't know this. I love science fiction. Um, so this is, was super fun when you asked me to come and uh, be here this evening. And when I think about one of the reasons why I love science fiction, and I don't think it's something that I put my finger on until I was an adult. As a kid, I didn't really get why I liked it, but I do think I really love the whole idea of the other and feeling sort of having that alien and feeling that as a kid. And, you know, I think lots of kids feel this way for different reasons, but I think that's what I've always loved about science fiction. So I wanted to start by asking you guys just about that sort of motif of science fiction, that notion of the other um, and how you all, and I'm just kind of curious about your current writings and how you reconcile that with sort of, this is a really big question that I thought I'd start with, just a really big <laughs> one, just sort of how you reconcile that with kind of real life right now and how we are making the other, like I feel like that's such a part of our political discourse right now. And I'm just kind of curious how it, how it feels as you all who write about this to see this kind of playing out in real life in such a very stark way. So, Mary, um, do Mary, Mary Robinette's gonna start. Great. So, I'll, I'll start mostly because Marianne looked at me and I was like, I guess I'm supposed to talk. <laughs> um, so, likewise, uh, it was something that, uh, that I read and, and loved growing up. And as an adult, one of the things that I have become aware of is how often I internalized really damaging narratives about the other. And uh, you know, in which the other was always an invading horde, in which the other was always terrifying. Um, or, and I say that even though there are plenty of examples where the other is um, delightful, like, you know, Mr. Tumnus is actually, actually, no, he's a traitor. Never mind, that's a terrible example. <laughs> until he betrays her, right. right you know, until he betrays Lucy. Right. Until he betrays Lucy. Uh, so, okay, terrible example there. Point being um, that, uh, that my my relationship with it as a child is very different than my relationship with it as an adult. Now what I do, since most of what I write in novel form is in his, the historical fiction mode, uh, to some degree or another, and what I've become aware of is um, the number of places where people have been written out and erased, mm -hmm. and so when I start the research process, I actually, I, I actively go and look for the people who were there historically and try to put them back into the narrative and also through conversations with people like Marianne become more aware of uh, the tropes that science fiction has as its um, as its building blocks and trying to make sure that I'm not uh, that I'm not building a, a house made out of, of, of shit. Nice. That was actually the word I was hoping you were going for. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I have a super complicated response to this, and like an That's emotional okay. response, right? Because um, I think feel like every day I wake up and I'm like, okay, do I spend the next few free hours I have on writing and creating these worlds, or do I join the resistance and go and like make phone calls and walk the street and you know, et cetera, so on? Um, and you know, I mean, the real answer is we do both, right? We don't. You don't actually have to pick one or the other. You do both. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back for a minute to like, when you first started asking about the other, I thought about Leonard Nimoy. I, when he passed away, I wrote an essay, um, uh, or not an essay, a sort of just a tribute, a memorial that appeared in Strange Horizons along with several other tributes, um, in which I talked about what it meant for me as a um, Sri Lankan kid who came to the US when I was two and a half, who grew up in a Polish Catholic neighborhood um, in New Britain, Connecticut. Uh, I, you know, I, I can still count to 100 in Polish, I can sing Christmas carols, Menoitsais and I do hash and teko amen, you know, like it's, um, probably my pronunciation's a little off after a couple decades, but, um, you know, I was, I was the only South Asian kid in the school until my sisters came, so I felt very othered, and Star Trek and Spock in particular was, like a salvation, really. It was, you know, there was Spock caught between two worlds. He wasn't Vulcan, he wasn't human, what was he? And um, I don't know, it, it provided a touchstone and an idea that there were people who moved between worlds who didn't quite belong anywhere. Um, and that was 
okay, they could still have friends. They could have really good friends, right? Um, who didn't necessarily always understand them, but that was all right too, right? So, so I think science fiction has always offered that as a model for me. Um, and now, when I write science fiction, um, it's often pretty political, um, and, and explicitly so. Um, the Stars Change is my sort of set of link stories that is my attempt at writing about the Civil War in Sri Lanka, and specifically the Night of Black July, but in the future, on a planet, settled by South Asians who have built a university, and of course they have, and, um, and it's the university of all worlds, and there are aliens there, but then there is, you know, an attack against the alien ghetto, essentially, and the locals have to decide whether to try to protect them or not, right, whether to put their own safe lives at risk. And in Sri Lanka, on the night of Black July, when thousands of Tamils were being killed in the streets, the Sinhalese, uh, many of their neighbors took them in, and you know, at, at risk of their own lives. I wrote another story when all the news was coming um, about the Syrian refugee crisis, right? I'd be reading article after article, you know, and your heart breaks and you feel like, what can I do? We were trying to set up some adoption stuff that was very hard to arrange. There was all these political barriers in place. And there was this whole rhetoric around violence, right? About like, oh, we can't let these violent people in. And, you know, at the time, um, my son had started kindergarten. He was having a lot of trouble. He was being pulled in. He got pulled into the principal's office 70, 17 times in his first year, which is a lot for a kindergartner, right? Um, he would be like standing in line and kind of flailing around and hit another kid kind of thing. And so we're having all these conversations about violence and like, you know, is my child too violent for public school, right? And all of that got distilled into a, a short story about um, space whales, like that, you know, on a planet where they're telepathic and the war has come and the humans are coming as refugees and this telepathic pacifist space whales are like checking you to see whether you're peaceful enough to be allowed into safe haven, right? Um, and and the, the, in the story, I've got this little kid whose mom is like taught her a chant that, to like help, you know, get past the telepathic space whales. But the little kid does what little kids do and like violence ensues and, and they're not allowed in. So there's, there's a spoiler, they're not allowed in, right? Um, and it was just a, sorry, that was a long thing. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is sometimes when we try and write about these issues in the real world, you run right up against everyone's um, already, you know, decided opinions, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. everyone, sure. like they have their assumptions, and when we take it into the science fictional realm, we can sort of look at these issues and um, just bring a different angle of vision onto it. Um, I'm sorry, I'm an English professor in my day job, so we talk about cognitive estrangement is the term. Um, and the way that that um, lets us, yeah, approach it differently. And, and is that really like a cognitive distance, in other words, also? Yeah, I think so. I mean, right, estrangement, it's just, it's just different, it's distant, it's, it's taken out of the realm of like what we already know, right? And I mean, this is when you think about all of the science fictional experiments, you know, the women writers of the, of the second wave, feminist wave, um, Joanna Russ, Gwen, um, you know, who were all, and this, this connects back to Mary's work, I think, kind of saying there are other modes for women than the social norm. Yeah, and I'm curious about that, because it's, this is also a point I wanted to pick, on, pick up on that, Mary, you made about stories that you feel like are not told voices that are not told. And I wonder if you feel like there is more room now and there's more openness to hearing these perspectives. Or do you feel like that's still kind of a tough sell for if you want to be mainstream? So if you want to be mainstream, um, I, I think unfortunately you, you still are going to have an easiest time, the easiest time if you're a white guy writing about white guys. Um, when you look at the books that get reviewed, and it's it's not, 
anyone, any individual person. It's it's just the systemic thing. Mm -hmm. When you look at the books that reviewed, um, they are predominantly reviewed by men. Strange Horizons, which Marianne is founder of, um, does a survey every year of science fiction and fantasy that's published, and it's uh, in the United States. The last count was, and it's held steady at this for the past several years, about 48% women, 52% men. But when you look at the books that are reviewed, like 3% of women, mm. you know, it's like 3% women. It's like, it's a really huge disparity. I was doing a, a thing, um, I travel a lot, uh, a lot, a lot. And so I do an informal airport bookstore survey where I go in and I count, and just in the science fiction and fantasy section, I just count the number of women on the shelf and the number of men, and um, it's an average of 18%. The best I have seen was in Australia, which was 34%. Mm. Um, but I've also been in bookstores where they had one sh book by a woman, and it was Ursula K. Le Guin. Right. Um, and do you think that's because of critics? Because I mean, there's been a really interesting conversation about Hollywood and diversity of film critics in the past couple of weeks. Do you think the same thing is true of this genre, or so, do you think it's a more systemic problem? It, it is a systemic problem. So um, basically, the, the way bookstores decide to buy books uh, from a debut author, uh, and in general, what they do is they, they look at the number of books that previously sold by that author. And if that author is a debut author, then they look at the number of books that the publisher has, has ordered for their print run, because that's an indication of the publisher's faith in, in the book. The publishers typically order larger print runs for their male authors than their female authors because the male authors sell better because they have historically. Because they have historically. Right. And then because they have a larger print run, the bookstores buy them more. And all, it's, a, it's this, it's this really fulfilling prophecy. Right? Exactly. Right. Um, likewise, the reviewers. There's only a handful of reviewers, right? And the reviewers have been historically predominantly men. And it's, again, not a thing that has, that's anyone saying, I'm going to keep the women down. Um, but it is a thing that you know the bookstores when they're sending out the review copies they're sending out the review copies of the books that they think are going to sell which are the books by men so do you think things like hidden figures and those just is that helping like i'm just thinking Absolutely. about I'm thinking about the hollywood like mainstream movie equivalent yeah. and the sort of crazy rich asians example that we've seen and how that's really put because i think the whole idea of diversity or different opinions is really just can this make money yeah yeah let, let me give you a really concrete example of the difference that hidden figures made so i i finished writing calculating stars um and turned it in october of 2016. uh the film was not yet out um or maybe maybe it, it came out somewhere right in there uh the, the book i know came out in september of 2016. right the book the uh that the film came out after that. But, point being, my beta readers, when reading my 1951 story, which was had all of these characters based on real women. Um, so, uh, Helen Ling was a, a real woman working at JPL. Uh, all of these women of color. And they were saying, oh, I really love your alternate history and how it allows you to have women of color in the computer sciences. And, and I'm like, these are based on real people. These are not, this is not alternate history. These are, like, JPL had a policy. First, that they only hired women for computers. And second, when you were hired, and this is in the 1940s, when you were hired at JPL, they had a policy that they asked, how do you feel about working with black people? And if you hesitated or said no, they didn't hire you. Mm, wow. Um, so, because uh, they're like, we have black people who work here are really good mathematicians. Why would we invite in a jerk. Um, so after, so I would, I would either get people going, it's amazing how you're putting these people in here, or, you know, I think even with the meteor event, I find it really implausible that they would hire a black woman to be a computer. And after Hidden Figures came out, all of those objections went away. All of them. Mm -hmm. 
And that, that is just a single concrete example of the difference that, that a media representation can make. And it does shift the dialogue. And I think that when, not only when it, it shifts the dialogue that, like that, but is then also economically successful, then, um, then that, that again shifts the dialogue. I think that's why um, we're seeing Captain Marvel being made, I think, and directed by a woman, thank you. Um, I think that's why we're seeing a lot of these shifts, but it, it is, the other thing about it is, it's not the first time in our history that we have had this shift in vision um, and, and then a backslide. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to go, oh, we've won, and we have not. Yeah. I mean, to be fair to the publishers, right, uh, publishing is an industry with tiny margins, right, it's, uh, it, and it's not, we're not making widgets, right? Like, you know, if you were making widgets and you could sort of like suss out the market, do your market research and be like, okay, if I make these bigger gears or whatever else, like I'll be able to sell X amount, right? Publishers, every book is a unique thing, right? It's its own unique, every novel, you don't know. You don't know what the audience is gonna respond to. So they are taking their best guesses. Um, uh, Nicola Griffith was one of my clarion instructors, and she brought in P&L statements, profit and loss statements, from a publisher at one point, and showed us how in any month-long period, they'd have one bestseller that was sort of like a known bestseller, John Grisham, you know, some, some big name, right? And that book was going to, they could predict a certain amount of sales for that, and that was gonna carry most of the rest of the month's books if they didn't earn out. Um, and a lot of them don't. And they, they'd have like then two or three mid-list people who were sort of reliably, probably would make some money. And then they'd have six, seven newbies, debut authors, who were gambles. And they were like, we're gonna like throw this at the wall. We love these books. We love all of these books, which is why we're taking a chance on it. But we have no idea what's gonna hit with the audience, right? And so, I don't want to let them off the hook, but I also want to sort of say, like, oh, oh yeah, you know, like there's there's a reason why they're so conservative, yeah, um, in you know, and they try and buy and and push what they know will sell, right? And and of course, a lot of these publishers are now owned by large distribution companies, media conglomerates, um, and so there's actually a lot more pressure on them to make profits than there was back when it was more of a labor of love. Yeah, and so we're I know we're. We're almost out of time, so I wanted to just end then by asking you guys a completely different question away from sort of the commercial side of this and just about the writing and the stories. And uh, Marianne, I'm thinking about your students and what you say to your students or what you say to other writers or people apart from all of the commercial success about why you do what you do and why you keep doing it. Um. <laughs> That's such a hard question. You know, I, I suppose I, you know, I just taught a creative writing class this afternoon. I would say most of my students, you know, they write because they love writing. They love the process of telling the stories, right? Um, they would love to make it big and become a bestseller, but that's not why they're in my class, right? And, you know, at least for me, I know that I get super cranky. If I don't write for a couple days because I'm busy with the kids or work or whatever else, my husband will be like, when was the last time you wrote? You should go write, <laughs> you know? Because um, I, I get difficult to live with. Um, and it's, it's, a lot of it is, is getting the thoughts out of my head, expressing them, and hopefully communicating to an audience. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for me, it is, um, so I'm, a, I'm also a professional puppeteer and there's this thing that we say in puppetry that the difference between a puppet show and playing with dolls is an audience. <laughs> and for me, it's, it's like, that is, I, I write, you know, I have daydreams. There are stories that I'm excited about. There are stories that I'm interested in but I write them down and then publish them because I want to share them with other people. And for me, a lot of it is the excitement that happens in that liminal space between author and reader. So it's about the community. It is about the community, very much for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good place to end, I feel like, right? right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great.